it's on. Whoa, Nelly. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for joining me for another True Stream. My name is Mike Hesh, and I'm with Healing Journeys today. And uh, wow. Uh, appreciate you guys joining with me today. Just uh, love this platform, love the what it's doing. Um, I've been just reading some of the uh, the feedback that we get from you all, and it's it's awesome. I mean, praise God for His Word. You know, it's, it says He sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. And the Word He sent was truth. That's what Jesus said. In uh, John 17, he said, thy word is truth. And when you receive that truth, you're receiving spirit and life because that's what's in the word. The words Jesus said that he speaks unto us are spirit and their life. Amen. Awesome. So um, let's see, before we get into our uh, topic today, uh, we have, let's see, a couple announcements. We have Pastor Rich Van Winkle for the month of November. And he, uh, yeah, check him out. He's been ministering healing. He has a powerful healing testimony. Uh, he's seen many, many healings, miracles uh, in his uh, uh, fellowship in Texas. Yeah, so check him out. And um, let's see, also, folks, you do not want to miss this. Listen carefully. If you're in, if you're being challenged, and you're not getting set free from anxieties, fears, traumas, all those kind of things. If you're not haven't received deliverance yet uh, from that, um, you need to go to the uh, Sound Mind Summit. That is going to be in uh, Calabasas, California. Julianne Hartman is uh, uh, you know hosting the event. And it's going to be one of our, uh, uh, I don't know what you call him. He has a show on the platform called The Sound Mind Show. And it's our beloved Kevin Chapman, Dr. Kevin Chapman. And he's got some good revelation. He approaches it from, he knows the, the physical part of it. He understands the physical part of it because he's a doctor. Uh, and then he also understands the spiritual part of it. So is uh, just if you're in the area, it's December 9th. It's called the Sound Mind Summit. You need to go to healingjourneystoday.com. The link is below where you can uh, uh, click on it and it'll take you where you can register. It is limited seating. So I encourage you, please uh, register early and, uh, you know, make plans to be there. This is, I mean, uh, when you think about it, uh, uh, it is an awesome event that, that uh, Dr. Kevin is doing. And uh, it's not, you won't see many doctors doing what he's doing. And I'm telling you, uh, you can't, it's just go. It, it'll be uh, uh, a blessing to you. And folks, it will not be live streamed. So um, you need to go to that event. And it's like a once in a lifetime opportunity, especially if you're in, you know what? I don't have a challenge with, with uh, fear or anxiety or trauma, uh, but if I lived near there, I would be. I would be there. <laughs> if there was room, I would be there, because we can always learn uh, to help others as well as ourselves. So anyway, enough for that. Um, now let's see what else. I think that was it. I'm looking to the gal behind the camera. And she's saying just, you know, she's giving me this, like, come on, come on already. <laughs> so uh, once again, my name is Mike Hesh. I am with Healing Journeys Today. And I titled our topic today, Healing in Capturing Thoughts. What do I mean by that? Go with me to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'll read where that capturing thought phrase came from. And we will follow our Father as he leads us to truth today through these scriptures. So it's awesome. You know, um, uh, I have a class that I uh, teach once a month uh, at, a, uh, at the church that I attend. 
And uh, it is on a Friday night. It's usually the first Friday in the month. And the last time we got together, we talked about our thoughts. And uh, I wasn't able to cover everything uh, in that uh, time together. Uh, but I did want to, these were just on my heart, some points that I'll, I'll repeat, but I will also uh, add some things that I wasn't able to get to in our last uh, time together. So in, uh, I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm going to read verses 3 through 5. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Think about that for a minute. The weapons God gives us pull down strongholds. Then he goes on to say, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Okay? Now, again, here's that phrase, bringing captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. Why is this important? Why did I say healing is in capturing thoughts? I want you to just reflect for a moment on some of your past thoughts, okay? I'm going to paint a little picture here of a scenario that I think all of us have experienced. But uh, I want to illustrate how a thought can take us captive unless we take it captive. And captivity is not a good thing, okay? Captivity isn't something that you want to be in. In fact, Jesus said when he came, he came to set the captives free, okay? So that word that says uh, bringing into captivity, it's actually a phrase that means to take by the spear. In other words, uh, th this is serious business that he's talking about here. And he's saying that it is a spiritual weapon that we have where we can capture a thought to its death. In other words, we're not going to keep it around and pen it up or shut it up in a closet somewhere in our head. No, we're going to destroy it. We're going to kill it by the spear, or we could say by the sword of the spirit, and that is the word of God. That's why it goes on to say, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Wow. So I said, again, I'm re uh, repeating myself, but healing in uh, capturing thoughts. Where is the healing in the capturing of thoughts? Well, check this scenario, okay? Okay. You are, let's say you get up in the morning, you're heading to the bathroom, you do your business, you're going out, you're fixing your tea, your coffee, getting some water, whatever your morning routine is. You turn around, you go back and you sit down to enjoy your, you know, your morning. And all of a sudden you have this pain that pops up somewhere in your body. Okay. Now it's not the pain that is the problem. I'm going to give you a second to think about that. The pain is not the problem. Do you know what the problem is? What, you, what the very next thing that comes into your mind about the pain. See, that is going to be the healing or it's going to take you captive. Okay? Now, let's build on that scenario a little bit. Let's say that you already have a predisposition towards fear, okay? What do I mean by that? Like, when something comes up, you panic. When something comes up, you, you always think the worst, okay? That's what I mean, a disposition for fear, okay, towards fear. Let's say you already have that disposition for fear. Then you feel a pain. You know what the thoughts that are going to be coming to your mind? is thoughts that explain or tell you why that pain is there, but all according to your flesh. See, that's what that's a thought that the enemy is going to bring to explain to you why that pain is there. 
Do you know the Spirit of God is the only other source for a thought? I'll back up for a second. There's two sources for our thoughts, okay? They either come, they're, and, and they're all spiritual. I'll get to that in a minute. It's either from God, ultimately from God, or it's ultimately from the devil, okay? There's only two sources uh, in this world. There's either good or there's evil, okay? Jesus said it. Our Father said it. That's all there is. There's good and evil. There's no kind of good. There's no gray area. There's no, it's okay. No, it's either good or it's bad. It's either good or it's evil, okay? It's either edifying or it's destructive. Amen? It's black and white. That's how, that's how our Father has portrayed it, okay? Now, let's say, i back up for a second. Uh, now that we know we have two sources for thoughts, and I'm not going to get into that in a moment. Uh, I mean, I won't get into that uh, today. That's a whole other topic. But on that foundation of it's either from God or it's from the devil, we have to stop for a moment and say, let's go back to the pain. Let's say you just have a pain in, in the back of your calf, okay? You sit down and all of a sudden you just feel this dull ache in the back of your calf, okay? And you're like, you know, the first thing you're probably going to do is touch it or rub it. <laughs> Most people would do that, like, you know, what did I run into or what did I do? Or So every thought that follows up to explain why that is the way it is, is what we need to bring captive to the obedience of Christ, okay? Now, like I just said a minute ago, the enemy is going to explain what it is, and he's going to tell you where it came from, and he's also going to tell you what you need to do about it, and you better do it right now. Don't wait even a second. You got to do it right now. See, that's the spirit behind the thought that comes to us when it's from the enemy. There's no time to wait. You have to deal with this immediately, okay? Now, he's the one that tells you it's a, it's a blood clot and it's starting to move up. It's gonna go to your heart, you're gonna die, okay? That's, that's all from the devil, okay? The contrasting thought would be our father and his word which would bring something to your remembrance that is truth. Like truth is, by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. So whatever that is, it's not something that is going to be harmful or that's going to hurt you or be destructive. Because those are all the fruits that come from the enemy, and you're a healed person. See, so what God is going to minister to you about it, the thought that's going to come to your mind when it's from our Father, is going to produce joy. It's going to produce peace. It's going to produce good. There's, it's going to stir faith in you. Okay? You can go look at the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, and you'll see exactly what when God ministers to you, that's what the Spirit is going to produce in your life. That's what He's going to, that's going to be the fruit of a thought that comes from our Father, okay? So if you receive His thoughts about your situation, it's going to produce healing in your life. It's not going to increase the trauma. It's not going to make you panic you're not going to be fearful. You're not going to break out in a cold sweat. You're not going to be anxious. It's going to produce peace if you receive it. Okay? Now, I know I've, I may have shared this before, but one day I had dinner with some friends, and, and uh, after, after uh, it was actually lunch, we walked outside. It was a beautiful sunny day. We stopped uh, in the shade against a building, and as I'm uh, like leaning against this building and we're talking, all of a sudden I had this feeling come over me like, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever experienced flu symptoms, but I had it once years ago. And so I, I, I remember, you know, what that was that came against me. And uh, I started to feel that way. In fact, that's the, 
if I, if, you know, thinking about it, that's the very first thought that came to me was like, the, uh, you know, uh, those are flu-like symptoms. That's what came to my mind. But you know, the very next thing that came to me was it wasn't so much a, like a thought like um, in this sense, what came to me was like, I don't know, maybe it was a thought, but this is how I felt. And uh, yeah, I guess it was a thought because this is what went through my mind and it produced a smile on my face was like, oh, don't, don't worry about that. That's, that's no problem at all. You know, or like, it's, it, you know, it's not going to stay. It can't stay. Something like that. It was just so casual that I actually just smiled. Like it just produced a smile on my face. Like, yeah, I don't need to worry about that. I don't need to be concerned about that. And, uh, you know, and the contrast there was for me, like flu-like symptoms was a third first thought, but I'm like, in, I guess deep down in my heart, I'm thinking, no, I can't get the flu. That's something that doesn't happen to me. And then the, the very next thing that happened was that thought of peace, like, ah, oh, it's no problem. And so much so that a joy that I manifested in a smile on my face, I just suddenly felt like it's going to be okay. Now, did the symptoms leave in that moment? No. I still felt the same way, but now my heart was perfectly at peace, perfectly at rest, and I just continued the conversation we were having. Didn't miss a, didn't miss a beat. Didn't, uh, I heard every word they were saying, but all this is going on in the background in my mind and heart. Okay? Now, if I would have, like, all of a sudden accepted the thought of the enemy, like, wow, man, I better do something about this. Then that's the way, that's the course I would have taken. Like I probably would have wanted to go home, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, take some vitamin C or, you know, whatever people do that get the flu. Since I don't get it anymore, I don't know what they do. So, you know, or uh, boil some hot tea, make some hot tea or, or you know, whatever. Uh, uh, those kind of thoughts would probably be following up or just wanting to get home and lay down or something like that. But you know what? That wasn't, I didn't want to hurry through the conversation. I had no place to go but hear this conversation. Okay? Now, the enemy is the opposite of that. He wants to drive you to follow his agitation, his anxious feelings, his uh, uh, fearful uh, attitude or thought about what's going to happen, you know? And so, we have to be on guard for that. And the, our first line of defense is our thoughts. We have to be aware that our enemy is not out here somewhere that we can see him. He's not, you know, he's not going to knock on your door one day and say, here, I have a delivery for you. It's, a, it's the flu. It's really not from me, the devil. It's from, you know, God sending it to you. You know, he, you're not going to ever see the devil like that. The devil comes as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's how he comes. But how does he communicate that roar to you that produces the anxiety or the, or the flinching or the like, oh, no. How does he do that? Through a simple thought. Okay? You know, he, he tempts us through thoughts. He challenges us through thoughts. That's the only way the enemy can communicate to us is through thoughts. You know, like I said a moment ago, thoughts are spiritual. They're not physical. They're spiritual. Uh, very quickly, go with me to Luke chapter 16. I just want to point out something here. In Luke chapter 16... There was two men that died, a rich man and a man called Lazarus. One was a beggar. One was, a, as it says, a rich man. Uh, and Jesus is showing us uh, through this account what happened after their bodies were placed in the grave. Okay? He showed us that these men continued to live. 
One of them was living totally separated in darkness away from the good of the Spirit of God. The other, Lazarus, was now in the bosom of Abraham. He was in a place of safety, a place of rest, a place of peace, all the fruits of the Spirit. But do you know that each one of them had all of their thoughts? They're communicating. You can hear Abraham responding to everything the rich man says, and the rich man responding to everything that Abraham says, okay? So you, you cannot speak a word without first having a thought, because words are a vehicle of thought. They are a means of communication. Do you know pictures work the same way? The devil doesn't always speak to you about a problem. He might just show you a picture about a problem. Something might flash in your mind that you've seen before. Okay? See, uh, that's a spiritual communication that's happening at the spiritual level. That's why I read 2 Corinthians 10 first was because I wanted to point out that thoughts are spiritual and God's given us spiritual weapons to defeat those thoughts. Now, thoughts aren't always, as I just said, they're not always like, we're not always hearing words that are thoughts. Oftentimes, it's just a picture, okay? Like, this is the danger of allowing uh, thoughts into your mind as pictures. And do you know how we do that? By what we watch. You know, what we watch on YouTube, what we watch on television, what movies we watch. See, that when we're watching something, our, our heart and mind are usually open, and it's putting things in that the enemy can use later to bring back to our remembrance by flashing it before our face again, okay? And like, for example, the rich man remembered that his brothers were um, lost, that they didn't know Christ. They hadn't really believed on God, okay? It, it also, uh, um, you know, it, it shows that he was in touch with all of his senses, and he remembered what it was like to feel differently, okay? Now, see, the enemy has that capacity uh, through a thought, a picture, an image to bring something to our mind that will produce a reaction in us. But again, we have the choice of how to address that or what we're going to do to address it, okay? We can either respond in fear, panic, anxiety. We can know right away if we're responding that way then it's the enemy. We're hearing his thoughts. What about, not necessarily about sickness or disease, but what about somebody tells you something and uh, it's not pleasant to hear, but it makes you mad and you changes your demeanor and your, you know, your, your voice or whatever, okay? Now, that could be good or bad, okay? in the sense that if you're responding to the enemy with force and you're casting down an imagination, something that's exalting itself against truth, and you're saying like Jesus did, driving the money changers out, you're doing that with the thought that came to your mind, then that's a good, that's the spirit of God being stirred inside of you. But if you're feeling like you have to do that to be free from it, then the enemy's mixed in a little bit of his works and performance with that, and that has led you off. Or if it's just pure anger, <laughs> then the devil's present, okay? If you're sharp and you're bitter in your responses, then you know that you are, you've been listening to the devil and you're reacting and responding to the thought that he gave you. Now, that thought may not be present in that moment, but that thought of might have been two hours earlier. Somebody cut you off in traffic, and then they hollered some choice words at you, and then they chased you down, and they kept honking at you and 
and, you know, swerving their car at you and yelling and hollering and screaming. And, and that got under your skin. And now it irritated you. You're ticked off. You Okay. And now somebody's saying, hi, how are you doing this morning? Oh, I'm doing fine. Why wouldn't I be? You know, it's like, whoa, <laughs> where did that come from? Well, my goodness, you still haven't let go of what the enemy did to you. And you know what? It wasn't, that's the bad part wasn't all the situation that happened to you because you're perfectly fine. But the bad part is what the enemy was telling you about what happened See, that's the part that gets under our skin. That's the part that the enemy uses to begin his death, destruction, and loss in our life. That's why we're told, uh, wait, let's go here. I know I said to go to uh, Luke 16. I didn't read it, but I explained it to you. But now you know where to go, and I encourage you to read it yourself. But go with me to Matthew chapter 15. Listen to what Jesus says here. Uh, Jesus is talking about how um, these uh, scribes and Pharisees uh, were really, like they were choosing, um, they were interpreting the word for themselves. They weren't going by what it said. They were going by what they thought would benefit them. And, uh, and Jesus tells them in verse um, uh, 7, he says, You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Okay, what is he saying there? He's saying, look, these people know the right thing to say with their mouth, and they, they you know, they're saying, oh, God is great, God is good, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. <clears throat> they know all the right things to say, but he said their heart is in a completely different place, okay? Now, let's go back to our scenario a moment ago where you somebody was, you know, uh, what would you say, was really mad at you while you're driving. Something you did, they didn't like, and now they're yelling, screaming, hollering, honking, you know, doing the whole nine yards. Now, you might walk in to work and somebody says, hey, how you doing? You say, oh, great, you know. Uh, and you might go to your room and then, you know, you're, you're still thinking about that. Your adrenaline is still pumping and you're like, what is with that? You know, I didn't do anything to that person. You know, why are they so mad? What, you know, and your mind and your heart starts going over scenarios. If you see that guy again, you're going to give him a piece of your mind or you're going to, you know, you should have cut him off in traffic. You should have you should have just let him slam into you. You know, all these thoughts are in your heart, but what was coming out of your mouth when somebody said hi, you know, oh, hi, you know, things are great. I remember when I was a kid, my mom would be very upset, angry, uh, you know, she'd be, you know, throwing things at us, you know, uh, and we're like, you know, dodging things as she's yelling and screaming and hollering. And the phone would ring. And she'd pick up the phone. Hello. Oh, hi. How are you doing? So sweet. So kind. And me and my brother would look at each other like, what? <laughs> what was that? And then she'd hang up the phone and she wouldn't miss a lick. It'd be like, boom, back to throwing whatever she, back to yelling. It was like, where did that come from? Well, that's what Jesus is talking about here. In her heart, she was angry and she had bitterness. And, there, you know, there's, there was motives behind that. But that was in her heart. But outside, she presented like everything was beautiful. And Jesus cautioned us against that. Listen to what he goes on to say. Um, he says um, to the disciples, he says to them in verse uh, 16, he says, uh, and Jesus said, are you, are you also yet without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatsoever entereth in the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. 
What we want to know is how did they get in the heart? It says right here, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are all things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands doesn't defile a man. He's saying it's not keeping your hands clean that's going to make your heart clean. He said, what's going to keep your heart clean is what you're meditating on. Okay? Notice, listen, listen to this. For out of the heart precede evil thoughts. If they're coming out of there, they had to get in there. How did they get in there? They came in through the door. They came in through our mind, what we received through our mind. And that could, it's not just words, folks. It could be pictures. You could watch something, and that could do the same as well. It says, this comes out of the heart, murders. I'm sure none of you have murdered anyone, okay? But have you hated somebody? If you've hated somebody, then you're a murderer, the Bible says. So where does hate start? It starts as a thought that comes to your mind, and as long as... as as you meditate on that thought, you're actually chewing it up like you're eating a piece of food. And when you swallow it, it goes down into your stomach. That's what happens when you chew on a thought for a while. It, it goes down into your heart. And then what does food do when it gets in your belly? It starts to be dispersed throughout your body. All that's in it goes to fuel the rest of your body. What happens when you receive an evil thought? It goes into your heart and it begins to fuel all of your actions because they come out of your heart. It says adulteries, fornications. Remember what Jesus said? He said, whoso looketh upon a woman to lust after her in his heart hath committed adultery. So you might see a beautiful man or a beautiful woman and... Uh, and you might have a thought come into your mind like, wow, what a body or, you know, wouldn't it be nice to this or that? And uh, that comes to your mind. But what are you going to do with that thought? If you keep thinking on that thought, Jesus said that lust after her in his heart. If you keep chewing on it and then you swallow that thought, so to speak, it's going to be in your heart. And then you're going to act out on it. But it's really You've already committed the sin because in your heart, through your mind, your heart and mind connection, you've already committed adultery. You've already gone through it. And then he says, thefts, okay? Do you know if you want something that's not yours and you pursue after it and try and get it at any cost, that's stealing also. And it says thefts. What about if, 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 uh, if you're saying things to other people that's robbing their peace from them? I know, you're, I know that we're not responsible for what someone else receives, but we can be a vehicle of Satan that he uses to rob somebody of their peace or their joy. Do you want to be part of that? See, the point I'm trying to make is that a thought comes into our mind. It's either from our father or it's from the enemy. And if we allow that thought to rattle around up there and we don't and we don't capture that thought by comparing it to what does the word of God say about this. And we need to say if this thought that I'm having does not agree with what the, the truth of God's word is, then I don't want any part of it. I'm going to kill it. I'm going to say, get thee behind me, Satan. I am not going to have this thought and leave it in my life where I can stumble over it later. You know, that's the point that Jesus made when he said in uh, Matthew 16, he said uh, to Peter, you know, Peter presented an, uh, well, let's go there. Did I read? Yes, I did read Matthew 15. Go with me just a page over to, to uh, Matthew 16. Listen to this. 
I'm going to start in verse 21 for sake of time. The clock's just is going very fast today. It says, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders, the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, be it far from thee, Lord, that that this shall not that this shall not be unto you i want you to get this picture the student is telling the master what he can and cannot do what's wrong with that picture okay something's wrong with that picture and listen to the language that it's using it says he took him picture this he's like Jesus is just like casually speaking these truths to the disciples, and he like takes him on the shoulder and turns him around and says, far be it from you, Lord, that that should be unto you. Okay? Now, he, it uses the word began to rebuke him. Do you know what the word rebuke means? It means to set a weight upon. See, what Jesus was saying to the disciples, the truth, there was no weight that was upon him through that truth. Now, listen carefully. That truth included him being abused by the leaders, being put to death on a cross, and then rising again. And Jesus didn't see that as a weight in the same sense that Peter is putting a weight upon him. Peter's like putting up a roadblock saying, you can't go any farther. In Jesus' mind and heart, that was an obstacle. Listen carefully. But Jesus turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. How do you think he said that? Oh, devil, get out of here. No. <laughs> he, he took it by the spear. He said, no. Ugh, out of here. Listen to what it says. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Listen carefully. Get this picture in your mind. Look at the terminology he's using. Get thee behind me. Most of us say, well, I don't even want the devil behind me. But listen to what he goes on to say. Thou art an offense to me. Do you know what the word offense means? It means a stumbling block. Jesus said, I'm going forward and I don't want any stumbling blocks in my path because I'm not turning around and going backwards. So I don't care what's behind me. I'm going forward. So he says, get thee behind me because you're an offense to me. If I follow what you're saying, I'll trip, I'll fall, I'll stumble. And how did Jesus recognize that that thought that thought that he was hearing was from the enemy. Well, it tells us right here. He says, For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. I've talked about this before in great detail, but, you know, Peter loved Jesus. It was probably the best friend he ever had in his whole life. And now his friend says, I'm going to die. Well, Peter, the moment he heard, I'm going to die or be killed, he's like, he stopped listening. No, you're not going to die. I, I just got you. You know, I'm still enjoying you. You can't go anywhere. That's of the flesh. That's a carnal, fleshly desire. What makes it carnal, fleshly desire? Because Peter was valuing it over God's word. See, Jesus just told him what God's will was for Jesus. And Jesus knew that ultimately that was the very best thing, not only for himself, but for Peter. But Peter couldn't see that. So when, when he heard that coming out of Peter, what did he say? He, well, he captured the thought. And he did it audibly. 
He took that thought that was coming to him as a dart to take him out of what God called him to do, and he took that captive. He took it with a spear and killed it right on the spot. Boom. Dead. I'm doing what God said. I'm not following after the emotions and the feelings of man. Okay? That's what he did. He took it captive. Jesus gave us his example. Now, he was vocal about it. Why? Well, it wasn't really necessary on his part. He did that for Peter's benefit. Because you'll notice it says, and he turned and said unto Peter. Okay? If he would have just said, oh, I know that's the devil speaking through him. Oh, I love you too, Peter. And then just walked on. How would that have benefited Peter? I can see Peter's mouth probably just dropped when he turned around and called him Satan. Okay? And what, an interesting point here is Peter was just moments earlier was hearing and receiving revelation from the Father. And Peter and Jesus said, wow, you're doing good, Peter. You're listening and hearing my Father. And then the next thing that comes out of his mouth is the devil. Do you know, folks, we shouldn't have sweet water and bitter water coming out of the same fountain, as James put it. We shouldn't. And that's why we need to capture thoughts. Do you know the enemy can take you down and bring sickness and disease into your life through just one thought that you receive, that you begin to chew on, that you become afraid of, then you're positioning your, yourself to let the enemy continue in your life. See, the thought from the enemy is a knock on your door. Can I come in and play? Can I come in and ruin your life? Can I come in and kill you? Destroy? That's what that thought is from the enemy. And we have to say, no, you can't. Come in. Get out of here in Jesus' name. That's basically what, what uh, Jesus did. He said, no, I don't agree with that thought. I recognize you're valuing what your, the flesh says over what the Spirit of God just ministered to you. He said, I don't agree with that. That's the devil. I'm casting that thought down. Folks, I'm repeating myself a lot today because it's important. It's very important. The uh, our, Us checking thoughts at the door is our first line of defense. It's important. I've I've ministered on this many times, but I just, well, again, I was impressed by our Father to, to go over this again. There's a reason why. Because the enemy is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but he just can't come up to you and kill you. He needs you to cooperate with him killing you. And he does that by getting, by starting with a thought in your mind that he speaks to you. You know, another very good point here in the scripture is that Peter was a friend of Jesus. He hung out with Jesus all the time. So don't think just because you go to church with your friends and they talk about the Lord all the time doesn't mean that the enemy can't speak through them something to you. Do you know that your friend has may have fears also. They may be really present a good game on the outside like we saw in uh, Matthew 15. They might be drawing nigh unto the Lord with their lips and uh, be very bold with their mouth. But what's in their heart? Do they have fears? Are they afraid of getting sick? Are they afraid of cancer? Just think about that for a minute. Yeah, I discovered when I was sick I know what all my friends would do if they got cancer. Do you know how I know? Because that's what they came and told me to do. And they all said, in the name of the Lord. How can the Lord have all those different minds about how to deal with something? Folks, he doesn't. But a person can be influenced by their own emotions to think that what they're saying 
the thought they're communicating is their own. And it's a good thought. Most people don't think, oh, I have bad thoughts all the time. <laughs> Most people think, I, th I think good thoughts. I wouldn't say a bad thought. Most people think that way. But was this a good thought or a bad thought that Peter gave voice to? It was a bad thought. On the surface, it looked good. But it was a bad thought. That's why we are told in no uncertain terms, we are told to capture every thought and bring it into obedience to the Word of God. Why? Because if we don't, it's going to get in your heart. And the Bible says to guard your heart with all, not some, but all your... Let's go there and read it. Because I want you to know I'm not making this up. This is actually the Word of God. These are His thoughts that He's communicating to us. And if we think His thoughts, they're only going to produce good fruit in our life. If we walk in agreement with His thoughts, then we're going to have a blessed life. We're going to be living uh, above the common. Notice what it says here. I'm in Proverbs 4, verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence. The word keep is translated elsewhere as guard or protect. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Not just good things, but bad things too. You can, you can receive, uh, like Peter, he mentioned this to Jesus because in his heart he was afraid he was going to lose Jesus. That was an opportunity to be a mouthpiece for the devil. The devil works through fear. So if, you have, if you've been diagnosed with something and you've told somebody, and now they're trying to tell you how to fight it after the flesh, you can say, get thee behind me, Satan, because you're not savoring the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. You know, in, um, where is that? I think it's in Colossians. Go with me to Colossians chapter 3. You know that phrase that says, for thou savorest not? The word savorest there, listen to how else it's translated. Go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. In verse uh, 1, it says, If you then be risen with Christ, notice what it says. If you're in Christ, that's what it's saying. Look, if you're in Christ, then seek the things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. He said, look, you're seated with Christ. So you should be thinking, meditating on, and living in the identity that you have in Christ. Then listen to what he says. Set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. Do you know that's the exact same thing that Jesus said here in uh, Matthew 16? Do you know the word affection there is translated in Matthew 16 as savorist? Yeah. So let's put that in there. If you can set your affection or your mind and heart on the things above, you can also have your mind and heart on the things of the earth. This is the exact same point that Jesus told Peter uh, and when he recognized the devil speaking through him. He was really saying the same thing. We could say this in reverse. When you're savoring or setting your affections on the things of God, you're not going to be savoring or, or having your affection on the things of men. You're not. Why? Because they're opposites. You cannot serve two masters at the same time. You have to switch back and forth, just like we saw Peter switching back and forth. He switched from speaking the words of the Father from his heart to speaking the words of the devil also from his heart. Because he esteemed, he valued Jesus more after the flesh than he did after the Spirit. 
okay? Folks, that's something we have to grow in, okay? We're new creatures in Christ, but if we don't set our affection on the things above, then our default will be what's most familiar to us. And most of us have spent more time meditating on the things of the world through all, doors, all sorts of mediums, television, uh, worldly conversations, you know, whatever you can imagine. Those are the things that we've been engaged in in the world, and what has it done? It's written things in our mind and in our heart. And many times, like Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if your heart is all full of the flesh and the world and earthly things and things that pertain to just man, then that's what's going to be coming out of your mouth. And you know what you'll find, how you find out what the most abundant thing is in your heart? When you get in a jam when you get backed in a corner, when you hear these words, oh, this looks very serious. When you feel that pain or it hangs on for a day, a week, now it's three weeks. See, you're going to find out what's in your heart. But folks, you know what? You can know before then. The Bible says that the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword dividing asunder soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. It's saying, look, only the word of God can divide between the flesh and the spirit. And the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Do you know why that's so important? Go with me to Romans chapter 8. Listen to this in Romans chapter 8. Paul makes this point here, verse 1. There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Stop a minute. He's saying, look, if you're going to walk after the Spirit, you're not going to experience any condemnation at all. But if you walk after the flesh, you're giving place to the devil. And that's going to allow condemnation to have a place in your life. He goes on to say, why is that possible? For the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus, and we're in Christ Jesus, has made us free from the law of sin and death. Okay, stop a minute. What's he talking about here? He's saying, look, do you really know that you have been freed from the law of sin and death? That there's a law working in you that is called the law of the spirit of life? That's the things which are above. Set your affection on the things which are above, not on the things of the earth, okay? The things of the earth are the law of sin and death. See, the enemy uses the natural world to bring death, destruction, and loss into our life. Do you know that if you're born again, you're never going to die? You can't die because you can't be killed. You're alive forevermore. Jesus said, he that believeth on me shall never die. So if there's death involved in something, then you know that your, your, connect, your heart is connected to your flesh in some way. He goes on to say, listen carefully, verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind or think about or meditate or have their affection set on the things of the flesh. See, whatever your mind and your thoughts are thinking about, your flesh is going to follow. It says, it says, they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Do you know that if you're meditating on the things above, then you're going to be following after the things of the Spirit, and what you're going to see in your life is prosperity, success, joy, goodness, peace, health, wholeness, healing, deliverance, the whole nine yards. Yeah, but it starts, what are you meditating on? What are you thinking about? Joshua said, our father said to Joshua, and he's repeated it unto us in many different ways, but I like the way it's worded in Joshua. He said, he said I want you to do this. He said, I want you to get into the word. What was the word at that time? The law of Moses. 
He said, I want you to meditate in that day and night. Don't, don't turn away from it. Don't let it depart from your mind or your, or your focus. He said, but keep it. Do what it's saying. He said, and when you do that, when you're meditating in that day and night, you're thinking about it, you're chewing on it, it's getting down into your heart. He said, you know what? By doing so, you're going to make your way prosperous and you're going to have good success. See, that's what happens when we meditate or our mind is focused on the things of the Spirit. There's no place for the devil. Why do you think Jesus so readily recognized when he heard that come out of Peter's mouth that that was of the devil, that that was Satan talking to him? Because Jesus did what's described here. It says, but they that are after the Spirit, they mind the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Do you think Jesus was all upset with Peter? No. He had perfect peace when he told him, you, the devil's speaking through you, Peter. And the way I recognized it is because I understand the difference between having your heart walking after your flesh and having your heart seeking after the Spirit. He said, I know where thoughts come from. They come from the devil or they come from my father. And that thought you just expressed to me through your words out of your mouth, that was Satan speaking. That's, that's something we should stop and take note of. Amen? It goes on here. Listen carefully. I'm in verse 6. It says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because, listen carefully, because the carnal mind the mind that thinks about the flesh and the natural world is what? Is enmity against God. It opposes God. Why do you think the enemy wants you to take note of his thoughts? He wants you to think about what he's talking to you about. He wants you to meditate on it. Because he knows if he can get you with that thought, it's going to eventually, if you don't cast it down, it's going to get into your heart, and you're going to be a pawn in his game. And the only end of that game is checkmate, folks. It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Folks, you cannot defeat the enemy with your carnal thinking. You can't say, oh, Okay, I'll do that, and then I'll defeat the enemy. Okay, that sickness that he's telling me I have, okay, I'll get rid of it by, I'm going to just change my diet, I'm going to start eating healthfully, I'm not going to eat any more sugar, I'm going to cut out all this. Folks, where did all those thoughts come from? See, the devil was the one who told you were sick, and now he's telling you how to fight it. Now, let me see. If his goal is to kill, steal, and destroy in your life, maybe you might want to check how the solution that he has to the problem he gave you, if that's really something you should follow or not. Folks, it doesn't make good sense. If the guy said, I want to kill you, and then he tells you, oh, do this, this, and this, is that really going to keep you alive? I don't think so. It's going to distract you and hinder you from receiving what is actually going to make you free. That's his goal. It goes on to say, um, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. You'll never fix the problem the enemy told you had, that you have by the solution that he's giving you. You won't, because it opposes what God has provided for you in Christ, which is all spiritual. Folks, let me just remind you of something. I've said it many times before, but... Do you know why our Father put sickness and disease on Jesus Christ? Because there was no cure for it after the flesh. None. There wasn't any cure for it. That's why it was placed on Christ spiritually. Okay? He became our substitute spiritually. How does Satan get sickness in us? 
and disease in us spiritually. It says, listen carefully, Acts 10, 38 tells us very clearly that every person that Jesus healed, he delivered them from oppression of the devil, for God was with him. Amen? That was good, it says, that he did that. It also tells us in 1 John 3, 8, that Jesus was manifested to get rid of sickness? No, to destroy the works of the devil. What is a work of the devil? Sickness and disease. That's what it is, folks. Sickness and disease. Why is it important to catch every thought and bring it captive to what the Word of God says? Because as a man thinks in his heart, that's what you're going to do. That's what you're going to be. Proverbs 23, 7. So you, you want to guard your heart with all diligence, and you start by making sure the thoughts that you're allowing to sink down into your heart are of God and of the Spirit and not of the devil and of the flesh. Amen? That's how you do it. Folks, it's, it's, uh, it's crystal clear. Wow. Anyway, there's so much more I, I could cover, but you know what? I, I think that we've uh, really nailed the point pretty good today. That, And, and again, I'm just going to reiterate this final thought, is that there is healing in capturing thoughts. Just like there's death in leaving a thought go that's not from God. It's going to separate you from the things that you already possess in Christ. And the thought that you don't take captive is the one the enemy is going to use to become a thorn in your side and a prick in your eye. And it could be death to your physical body. So, folks, I'm just encouraging you that God has never told us to do something that we are not capable of doing. So when he said to capture every thought and bring it into the obedience of Christ, we can all do that if we will just do them one at a time. Amen? So God bless you. Thank you so much for joining me, and have an awesome rest of your week. Thank you.